Good morning, everybody. Welcome to VSTG. We are only three, uh, three seminars away from the end of the this this year for us. I guess the school year. So we'll, we have uh, our presentation today from Batsy Fisher from the University of St Andrews. And somehow I didn't put your uh, title up on the website, which I completely meant to. Um, let's find that. And then next week we have Christoph Hubeck and then Maude Boyette. And then we have our summer break. We will come back again uh, after a few months to uh, start back up in September. So Batsy, Batsy's talk today is titled A Case for Zircons and, and Mafic Magnetites Resolving some of the geochron geochronology of the polyphase Lewisian Nice Complex in Northwest Scotland. Um, I will, I that, that's all for my announcements today. Andre, would you like to say anything? Oh, I think we are good. Okay. I'll give more details on how the schedule will be in the coming, uh, after the summer break and the next couple of uh, seminars. But for today, I'll go ahead and I'll introduce Batsy for us. So Dr. Batsy Fisher is a metamorphic petrologist and geochronologist with specific interest in mafic magnetites. He received his undergraduate degree at the University of Mainz in Germany and worked at the Max Planck Institute for Geochemistry before he capitalized on his interest in Precambrian metamorphic rocks for his PhD at the University of St. Andrews. He started his degree with Peter Cawood and Chris Hawksworth, Haw Hawksworth, who both left St. Andrews while Batsy stayed behind to finish his PhD under the supervision of Tony Prey. Today, he works as an instructor and lab manager at the University of St. Andrews. I was originally introduced to Batsy as my TA for field camp with the University of St. Andrews back in the summer of 2017, which is one of the best experiences of my life. So if anybody's knows people looking for a great field camp, send them to Scotland. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, we had a stop where Botsy spent some time introducing us to Magnetites and he talked a little bit about the project we're gonna hear about today. So really excited to have you Botsy and uh, please go ahead and share your screen, unmute yourself and take it away. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction um, and also for uh, the praise for our field camp. Yes, please do come and join us in Scotland and look at some of the rocks that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so you've already set my title. Before I get started, I just quickly want to acknowledge some of the funding that made this research possible. Um, a scholarship from the University of St Andrews and also in-kind grants for analytical time at the Edinburgh Iron Probe and for multi-collector ICPMS at um, what is now called the National Environmental Isotope Facility. So uh, this is a picture of me sitting in the beautiful landscape of Northwest Scotland, looking over the Louisian Nice. And the Louisian has now uh, been described and studied for well over 150 years. But still, there are some fundamental questions about it that are unanswered. For example, for the past 20 or 25 years or so, there has been a fair amount of discussion about the so-called terrain model. Some authors suggest, based on zircon geochronology, that the Louisian is made up of several small terrains with distinct geological histories. Others maintain, on the other hand, that it is a more or less contiguous piece of crust that is merely cut by shear zones that juxtapose different crustal levels. Uh, this is insofar an interesting problem as an, uh, as an amalgamated uh, terrain would imply some sort of horizontal plate tectonics and the relevant ages of the Louisian fall in the time between 3 and 2.5 billion years ago. Um, and that is a time in which Earth may have transitioned from a non-plate tectonics, vertical stagnant lit regime to horizontal plate tectonics. So it would be quite interesting uh, to know whether plate tectonics was necessary to form uh, the Louisian complex as we know it today or not. Uh, so today I want to address mainly two questions. Is the Louisian a contiguous piece of Archean crust or is it an amalgamation of small but distinct terrains? 
And because almost all of the studies that have led to this terrain model um, were done on felsic rocks, I would like to take a new approach and ask, can zircon geochronology on mafic migmatites answer this question? Um, and if they could do it here, they can probably do it elsewhere too. Uh, so I first want to uh, sort of present uh, the hypothesis and why I think that mafic rocks might be better than felsic rocks for zircon geochronology, particularly in high-grade nice terrain. Um, and I'm going to talk you through a sort of hypothetical zircon load of um, both mafic and felsic rocks. And I'm going to start just with the magmatic story. So here on the right is a cartoon um, of uh, a mafic intrusion. Uh, mafic magmas originate typically in the mantle or from melting of ultra mafic um, older crust. And um, as part of that melting process, they might incorporate some zircons. I've got some metamorphic zircons in green here and just some inherited grains uh, in blue. But the great thing about mafic magmas really is that because they um, are so low in zirconium and silica contents, they really haven't reached a zirconium sat a zircon sat saturation. And so any zircon that they um, assimilate, um, either by inheritance directly from the source or as they uh, grab material on the way through the lower crust, uh, that zircon should really be dissolved uh, because it's not really stable in the mafic melt. So we lose most of the um, inherited zircon in mafic rocks. And really the only zircon that we get in mafic igneous rocks uh, forms at the final stages of emplacement where either interstitial melts or melts in contact with growing crystals uh, sort of come to the point where they reach saturation in zircon and form uh, small zircon crystals. But that's about it. Um, on the other hand, felsic uh, magmas, uh, have a much more complicated form formation history. Um, they could just stem just like the uh, mafic magmas directly from mantle melting and just uh, fractionate um, within the crust during the ascent. But as soon as they reach uh, a certain a certain degree of fractionation and um, intermediate to felsic compositions, they will probably start forming zircons long before they actually reach their final point of emplacement. Um, so we get some zircons that firm um, earlier than they are sort of the igneous ones here in, in orange. But as we then continue, um, and if we have sort of a stalling in, in um, crust levels before the actual uh, magma gets in place and its final um, crust level, then we might even get uh, igneous overgrowth on these earlier igneous uh, zircon grains. Uh, the other problem or, or um, thing about felsic magmas is that they don't necessarily have to form by direct melting of mantle material, but they often form by uh, melting of, of the crust, either by older mafic rocks, so if mafic rocks start melting, they form felsic magmas, or just by melting of anything else that's in the crust, and that could include sediments or metasediments, all of which probably will have uh, some zircon in them already, which then will be incorporated into the newly formed melt. And because that newly formed melt will be felsic, it won't necessarily be as powerful at dissolving any sort of inherited zircon. So a lot of this um, zircon that was already present at the time of melting will be incorporated into the felsic melt and then um, ascend to the final uh, emplacement area and um, probably have variable amounts of overgrowth as part of the uh, final crystallization of the felsic melt as well. Um, so if we look at the, the um, zircon grains that we get, they are much more diverse and, and represent many more um, parts of, of the crust that are not necessarily only related to uh, the emplacement of the igneous uh, rock. If we then introduce metamorphism, um, and particularly high-grade metamorphism and heat uh, the crust up to the degree where it starts melting. And we will have our mafic nice and dark gray here. Uh, so we're looking at the mafic um, melting rock first, and we will have some of our initially formed final emplacement igneous uh, zircon grains. And we might have some uh, metamorphic zircon grains that have formed as part of uh, this prograde PT path that's brought us to the, to the partial melting. And as then the mafic rock starts to partially melt, it will separate a felsic tonalitic melt 
and that has the uh, a um, it will inherit some of the zircon grains that were already present, and it will also start forming um, what we could now call igneous uh, again rims over those um, cores that they inherited from the mafic protolith that that partially melted. That partial melt, um, if we if we reach a critical amount, will not necessarily just stay there, but it might uh, move on into like uh, melt channels that sort of move the melt out of the source area that partially melted. And in there we could um, crystallize a more zircon, but we can also mix in zircon from other sources. So these this is represented by these little blue uh, things here. So really, uh, by the time that we get into these uh, melt channels, and they can be only a few tens of centimeters wide, um, we can already have a sort of mixed, mixed signal. So really, uh, if you want a simple story, we need to look at this uh, in situ leucosome and, and mafic nice part. Comparatively, uh, a felsic migmatite that starts partially melting, we start with a much more complicated zircon load um, with purely igneous grains, but also with igneous rims around inherited material. And if we then partially melt that, we form the new sort of migmatitic uh, overgrowth over um, these already hybrid uh, multi-story grains and we end up eventually with grains that have uh, two or three or even more phases within a single zircon crystal all of which relate to a um, sort of igneous or metamorphic um, uh, date and then the question is what does this date actually represent in terms of an age for the rock um, if we then look uh, sort of at an, at an almost summary what that would look like in terms of a zircon lot of a sample that we just pick. If we took a mafic migmatite, um, either sample A or probably more like sample B here, one of those in situ leucosomes, what would it look like? We might get a few inherited cores, but they should be very limited because as I said, the mafic uh, magma would have assimilated most of them. And then really most of the cores that we find um, should date the protolith zircon. So they would be the igneous zircons that form the, the final stages of crystallization of the uh, mafic uh, magma before it was metamorphosed. And if we then have a metamorphic event happening later, we might get a few prograde uh, metamorphic zircons. And really then at the stage of um, where we reach peak temperatures and start to partially melt uh, our mafic now nice, we will form these um, Migmatitic overgrowth that would then date the peak metamorphism and the melting event. Um, a felsic rock that we sample, a felsic migmatite at the same time, uh, should look more complicated. We would expect more inherited cores because we didn't dissolve as many, um, because um, zircon saturation might have already been reached in the magma. Um, and we probably have a sort of protracted crystallization history of the felsic magma. We have early zircons that are related to um, the, the fractional crystallization of the magma before it was actually in place. And then we have lots of inheritance in the cores as well that might have small overgrowths related to the uh, emplacement. But already this is like uh, probably a bit more tricky to uh, take apart. Um, then if we metamorphose, we will get, again, a few prograde zircons, but we, are, we should also get probably a wider spread of magmatitic zircons, simply because a felsic uh, rock will start melting early. And as we heat the crust up, um, as soon as we hit the, the solidus and, and the felsic rock will start to melt, it is also the potential to form or reform a new zircon. And I will do that up to the peak um, that is similar to the um, mafic rocks. So, and this is uh, complicated, and this is only after one metamorphic event, but many mentioned ancient nice terrains, such as the Louisiana, are actually polymetamorphic, so the story might be even more complicated. So, if I can just quickly recap uh, this hypothesis that I'm putting forward is that uh, in theory, mafic gneisses or migmatites should contain zircons that are easier to interpret because mafic magmas should dissolve a lot of entrained zircon and thus reduce the inheritance. Mafic magmas form zircon mostly at the final stages of crystallization, so we really only get actual igneous uh, emplacement ages. 
Um, and therefore, mafic magmas are not subject to all of these circumforming or preserving processes that act in felsic magmas, uh, such as inheritance from a variety of sources, mixing of certain zircon-laden magmas, and prolonged igneous crystallization. And this is just for the um, igneous story, the proto story. And then if we move uh, into the metamorphic story, it's get e it gets even more complicated. So the hypoth hypothesis that mafic gneisses should be easier um, is nice. Now we should really test that. And for that, I would like to go to the Louisian complex, um, A, because it's on our doorstep here, but also B, because it's been studied for a very long time. And there's still some unresolved questions that I hope I could um, answer with this new approach. For those people not familiar with it, the, the, the Louisian is uh, located in the far north, northwest of mainland Scotland and the Hebrides. So on the right here is a geological map of the entirety of Scotland. And the Louisian is the pink colors in the northwest on the outer Hebrides. The top is the Isle of Lewis that gave the Louisian its name. And then we've got uh, a few sort of outcrops um, about 100 to 150 kilometers long and maybe 50 kilometers wide on the mainland. And because it's been studied for a long time and travel has uh, become easier recently only, um, the mainland complex is by far better studied. So a lot of people don't venture out really to the Outer Hebrides, although they are quite beautiful. So it's worth a visit. Um, in a broader context, uh, the, the Louisian is part of the North Atlantic Craton and therefore part of Laurentia. And here's a, a sort of reconstruction of that um, where the Louisian falls. We have got the outline here of Greenland and the North Atlantic Craton uh, sort of straddling the south of, of Greenland. And the Louisian originally was part of the North Atlantic Craton and then was caught up in some of these mobile belts uh, while, while that uh, sort of um, area was amalgamating into a larger supercontinent. Um, and yeah, I should say to the east, uh, the Louisian is probably buried under the, the, what we call the Moine. It's like a series of, of meta sediments and they've been pushed along the Moine thrust and that's really marks the Eastern boundary of, of the outcrop of Louisian. Um, initially, the Louisian was really in detail looked at for the first time in the late 1800s as part of the Highland controversy. And that was a, a sort of a time in, in earth science research um, where, where people really de de still developed fundamental understanding of how the earth works. And the Highland controversy was really a, a thing pushed by, by Lapworth against the establishment saying that we could actually move packages of rocks laterally and deposited older rocks onto young, younger rocks. Um, and then uh, Peach and Horn were, were methods from the BGS that went up to the Northwest Highlands to sort of like uh, check whether these theories that lap was put forward uh, were true. And actually as part of this, eventually uh, we, we established the process of thrust faulting and, and, and implications uh, really with uh, this Moin thrust that I've just outlined being sort of the type locality of a thrust fault, where it was for the first time described in detail. But as part of this mapping campaign that culminated in a publication in um, 1907, that summed basically the entire previous 20 years of research up, um, Pete and Horn uh, have split the mainland into three districts based on their, their mapping observations and by mainland, I mean the mainland Louisian. And they found that in the central region, we have gray pyroxene gneisses that contain blue quartz, whereas in the north and south, uh, we've got hornblende and biotite gneisses. At the time, they didn't necessarily knew what that meant because Escola hadn't developed the passes concept yet. Uh, but now we know that that basically means we have granulite facies assemblages in the central region here in black, and we've got uh, amphibolite facies assemblages in the northern and in the southern region, which are shaded in white here. As people kept on uh, kept on going back to the Louisian Nice as sort of the oldest crust really of, um, of Britain and, and one of the oldest of Europe, they figured that out that uh, there were more, more than one metamorphic event um, and that really we could use the Scourry Dyke Swarm as a marker horizon. So the, the mythic uh, dikes of the Scourry Dyke Swarm intruded into the Louisian. And if we look at an old map here, we see 
uh, there's loads of them sort of mapped in the central region. But as we come to the boundary along Loch Luxford here to the northern region, none of them have been mapped in the northern region. And that is because they are pristinely preserved in the central region, but completely overprinted in the northern region and in the southern region as well. So they separate two metamorphic events. We had a pre-dike event that caused this granulite facies metamorphism in the central region. Um, and that was for the scoury dikes and the area of scoury that I set up in earlier, um, termed the scourian uh, by Sutton and Watson. And uh, we had a post-dike event that cut and overprinted the dikes uh, elsewhere but the central region. And because uh, sort of the type of locality is just north of Loch Luxford, it was termed the Luxfordian. And this is why we haven't mapped any scurry dikes in here because they completely disrupted. Um, here's an example. All of the gray bits here are interpreted as a scurry dike. Uh, in between here, we see some gray nice. So that would be the TTG. That's actually a host rock um, up here as well. And all of that has been disrupted and intruded by uh, Laxfordian age, uh, Laxfordian granites related to the Laxfordian event. And this road cut is um, definitely occurring in every first year uh, British geologist um, lecture, and most students probably have visited that as well. Um, as people then kept looking even closer at the Scorian, they uh, showed, uh, and, and Evan sort of uh, brought that up. Um, that there were two deformation events even before the scurry dikes. So there was an earlier event um, that was granulite facies um, and was sort of dominated by shallow fabrics, as in the picture on the left here near Batkal. And because it's it's fairly well preserved in the area around Batkal, it was termed the Batkalian. And that sort of dominates most of the central region. But locally, uh, this Batkalian fabric is uh, reworked along steep shear zones uh, to later amphibolite facies, maybe granulite facies, maybe not. People argue a bit about this. Um, but here you see examples where the fabric is much steeper, and, and this is within these invariant uh, localized shear zones of retrogression, which leads us roughly to a cross section with the central region on the right and the northern region on the left here, where we've got the early Batkalian granulite facies structures that have been overprinted locally by steep invariant fabrics, intruded then by the scurry dikes. And uh, later in the northern region, those scurry dikes have been deformed by Laxfordian um, uh, reworking and also intrusion of Laxfordian uh, granite. If we now want to uh, think about PT conditions, uh, since we want uh, to make sure that we actually have um, conditions suitable to melt our rocks, People have looked at PT conditions for the Louisian basically since the early 60s, where O'Hara started work on that. And uh, more recently, uh, methods have become more complicated. And now people largely use this mineral equilibrium modeling, which works uh, by taking a rock, grinding it up, and then calculating um, from thermodynamic data potential stabilities for minerals uh, for a given PT. And if you repeat this exercise a lot of time, you end up with little fields uh, of mineral assemblage that would be stable at these PT conditions. And all you have to do then is find the field that uh, represents the mineral assemblage in your rock sample. And then you know at which PT conditions uh, your minerals have equilibrated. Uh, most recently, if Faisal has done that for the entirety, pretty much of the central region, so for the granulite facies part, and he's plotted several sample locations in all of these fields, and they roughly all overlap with a peak somewhere around this uh, orange field here. And that corresponds to 8 to 10 kilobars and 900 to 1,000 degrees um, at peak uh, PT. The later invariant has been um sort of estimated to be uh five to six kilobars and about 550 degrees using a similar method and uh, the laxfordian uh, already 20 years ago with conventional geobarometry has been uh, estimated to be about six uh, kilobars and 550 degrees as well so now uh this talk is meant to be about geochronology as well so uh, eventually uh, with the advent of dating techniques and, and 
quite early on, people went to the Louisian to uh, date it, uh, including Arthur Holmes and then Steve Morbath using bulk rock methods. And later on, people started sort of to try uh, zircon geochronology uh, in the Louisian. And the problem is, if you just take any sample in the Louisian, it's uh, in all likelihood, you might get a plot like this. If you just chuck all your zircons in, date them, uh, and you get a massive smear of, uh, concord of a concordant ages that smear along the Concordia, and it's really hard and often impossible to sort of like really make sense of that. Uh, I've just picked this example. They've actually separated uh, a few ages out of that by, by looking at zonations. Um, this is just all of their data as an example. But even if you do a careful sort of selection into like, is this analysis on a core? Is it on a rim? Is it on single phase, meaning completely unzoned zircon grains? You still have pretty much the same range from uh, just over 2.9 billion years uh, down to 2.4. Or if you're in the realm of the Laxordian, you even go down to 1.8. So it's not easy. Um, what is comparatively easy compared to, to the Nices is to date the Scari dikes because they were the last event that happened in the central region. So they're not heavily overprinted. And using Bedeliite, uh, they have been dated at 2.4 and 2.0 uh, billion years ago. So there were two dike intrusion events. And the Luxordian, again, because it was sort of the last thing that happened to the northern region, is also a bit better dated at 1.8 to 1.7. Uh, and this is a bit of a range uh, because there's probably two or three Luxordian events, really, that, that caused zircon growth, but all fall within this uh, um, about 100, billion, uh, 100 million years. In the Nices, if you just take all the ages that have been reported across the Louisian, uh, we have recurring ages that are older than 2.95 billion years. We've got ages that are 2.8 to 2.7 billion years. We've got ages that are 2.5 billion years. And depending where you look, we've got ages of 1.8 to 1.7 billion years. So we've got four dominant ages that keep on coming uh, if, if we date these rocks. And we've got four events that we want to uh, account for. We've got the protolith formation. We've got the Batkalian granulite facet metamorphism the invariant amphibolite facies, maybe granulite facies, metamorphism, and then the Laxfordian amphibolite uh, overprint. So technically, it, it's easy and uh, solved and everything is fine. Um, but as people then actually looked at uh, the spatial distribution of where they got these ages, um, it got complicated again, and it sort of uh, eventually led to the proposal by Kinney of this terrain model. And this, this um, uh, is based on the presence or absence of certain ages in samples. Um, it's basically, in if, if I take a sample from here and I date it, I might not get all of the four ages. And if I take a sample of here, I might get uh, also not all of the four ages, but I get different ages from my first sample. And they've done both a new dating campaign, but also a, sort of a, throw, a, a crawl through the literature. And they've then suggested that actually, based on the geochronology, there are several uh, blocks that can be defined based on the zircon geochronology and they're all bound by fault zones. And people have sort of jumped onto them and, and a lot of people have adopted this. And the last time I sort of checked, I think I counted about 13 different terrains that were established uh, based on geochronology and, and observations. But the thing is that not everybody agrees with that. And there are really uh, quite a few arguments and, and papers and comments on papers and re-comments against the comments about how to interpret some of these ages. So some authors uh, see these ages and some authors uh, don't see these ages uh, in their sample from within one of these uh, alleged terrains. So one good example that I'm uh, gonna spend more time on for the rest of the talk is the subdivision of the central region. And that's based on the protolith ages and the ages for the first uh, granulite facies event. So if you look here, the uh, central region is now in orange, representing granulite facies. And, and in the terrain model, um, that, that sort of database at the time had uh, 2.96 to about 3 billion year old protolith ages for um, the northern part of the central region. And in the southern part, they only found 
four um, billion year old protolith ages. So about like 100 to 200 million years uh, difference in protolith ages. And again, uh, in the terrain model, uh, they said that they only find uh, evidence for the first granulite fences event to have occurred at about 2.5 billion years, whereas in the southern part of the central region, they have only uh, they they already see the first granulite fences event at 2.7 billion years. And on the basis of that, and the fact that sort of through the middle uh, runs the so-called Stratham line, like the structural uh, sort of a shear zone. Um, They've separated the central region into the ascent, uh, in their case, terrain, and the Grunert uh, terrain in the south. I'm going to try and just refer them as neutral blocks um, uh, from now on. Um, and, and the problem really with this interpretation is that other people uh, in their samples, they say, but we actually see a 2.7 event also in, in the um, ascent block. And then they say, oh, maybe these are just two different crust levels of actually the same piece of crust. We got the 2.7 event affecting both. And then the 2.5 event, which was lower grade, only affects the ascent uh, block, while the Grunert block might have been deeper in the crust and not affected by this uh, overprint. And then later, they were juxtaposed along this uh, Stratham line. And now they're at the same sort of topographic level, despite having formed at different crustal levels. So if I recap just uh, this, this uh, background of the Louisian, uh, there are three main blocks. There's the northern and the southern region, both of which are amphibolite facies. And then there's the central region, which is granulite facies. Um, we've established about a handful of sort of tectonic events. We've formed protoliths. They were metamorphosed at Batkalian, uh, in the Batkalian event to granulite facies. Uh, they were metamorphosed again in the invariant event to amphibolite, maybe granulite facies. Uh, they were intruded by the scoury dikes, and uh, in the northern and southern region, they have been overprinted by the Luxfordian amphibolite facies event. And a few Luxfordian um, sniffs are, uh, can be found in the central region as well, but very, very localized. And then this terrain model, based on geochronology, subdivides the central region into the ascent block with a, a comparatively younger uh, granulite facies event, but older protolith and the Grunert block with a comparatively uh, older um, granulite facies event and slightly younger protolith ages. And as I said, um, or maybe I haven't said this, I, I think I said it at the very beginning is that pretty much all of this geochronology and subdividing is based on uh, geochronological studies of TTGs. Um, the great thing is, though, that the central region also contains mafic and ultra mafic bodies. And here on that map, uh, we've got by by uh, Tim Johnson. Um, we've got uh, twelve bodies listed, sort of twelve ultra mafic bodies. And because they're in the central region, and we know that the PT conditions were pretty much the same all across at about a uh, thousand degrees, uh, they have obliged and they have partially melted and now look like this, uh, with nice mafic gneisses and sort of uh, in situ leucosomes with uh, black salvages and uh, peritectic phases in them. And if you cast your mind back, mind back, that pretty much looks exactly what I need uh, where I postulate that actually the zircon in a mafic migmatite should be more straightforward to interpret. So um, maybe uh, we can have a look at these mafic migmatites in the Louisian and see whether their zircon geochronology is more straightforward. To do that, we need a few samples. Um, so I went to the Louisian and collected samples uh, from three localities. Uh, the first one is called Knockgorm and lies sort of in the realm of the Laxford shear zone, which separates the uh, amphibolite facies northern region from the granulite facies central region. And the second locality is at Scourie Moor. Uh, safely within this uh, proposed Athens block. And the third um, locality is at Loch Am, and I have no idea how to pronounce this Gaelic name, um, but this one is uh, safely in the Grunard block. I haven't picked one down here, so I'm not missing out any sort of like 
potential complications in uh, this area that's covered by later sediments, uh, but it's far enough south uh, from the Strathon line to not be directly influenced by it. And at each locality, I try to collect uh, at least three samples. One may fig nice without any leucosome in it, ideally. Uh, then some bits of the leucosome where I have got perigectic minerals in it, so I'm sure it's a it's a fairly in situ leucosome, and then also a felsic sheet that is sort of in petrographic continuity, like over here, uh, with some of the leucosomes, but that is uh, also uh, probably lacking most of the perigectic minerals, showing that it is a major pathway that sort of melt went through, and then I uh, wanted to compare the areas of these uh, different. Uh, bits. So uh, Knock Gorm in the Laxford Shear Zone um, realm is a fairly extensive mafic body, um, probably extends for uh, 10 or so kilometers sideways and is about uh, a few hundred meters across. It's largely amphibolite facies assemblages, sort of in keeping with this Laxfordian overprint, but it's a nice garnet bearing mafic nice and the garnets do get quite large, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with British confectionery, but here's a cream exoscale. Uh, and here I've chosen a more familiar S-wing hammer uh, for scale. But the actual migmatoids uh, contain abundant garnet as well. And we can see sort of the interstitial leucosomes feeding into um, a, a leucosome with plenty of uh, what is now amphibol, but they interpreted to be replaced in peripectic phenopyroxene. So this is one of the sample locations and there's a second one as well. Um, I haven't had a felsic sheet here yet, but the uh, great thing about Knockholm is that actually the entire length of, of the mafic body is cross-cut by uh, a tonalitic gneiss sheet that is foliated and in places you can see these small leucosomes that are formed locally with peritectic phases to feed into uh, this felsic sheet. So this will be my sample number four. Um, in Scarry Moor, in the Ascent block, uh, I've gone to uh, a very uh, a sort of medium-sized layered mafic to ultra mafic body. Um, and this is the, the sort of Scarry area is one of the best preserved granulite facies areas. And towards the uh, stratigraphic bottom, this layered body shows relic magmatic layering um, into ultra mafic, basically pyroxenines and, and um, um, peridotites and that don't show any evidence of partial melting, but further up where it's sort of uh, uh, metagabro, uh, there's definite evidence for partial melting. Um, and here's a sample where we see some of the small uh, leucosomes that are in situ with their peritectic uh, phases, sometimes amphibole after CPX, sometimes garnet. And we also have a felsic sheet that cross cuts the mice and doesn't contain any peritectics, but again, can be seen to be in continuous uh, contact with with these leucosomes, so it's co-equal to them. And then the uh, unpronounceable locality in the Grunert block is a comparatively small body that's largely retrogressed to amphibole uh, or amphibolite, but it's uh, got abundant leucosomes with amphiboles, again, replacing perichectic garnets, um, and this will be the sample set number 11. Um, now that we've got our samples, um, normally we would look at the geochronology uh, first before we get into more complicated things like hafnium. But because geochronology has proven uh, difficult in that area anyways, um, we wanted to have a look what hafnium isotopes can tell us um, as well. So we'll do that first because that has some implications for how we can interpret the um, geochronological data. For those people not too familiar with how hafnium isotopes work, it's based on the decay of lutetium, lutetium to hafnium, um, and lutetium is more compatible in, in the mantle than it is in, in the uh, than hafnium is. So if we have an event where we separate melt out of the mantle, um, because the lutetium in the mantle will be greater than the lutetium uh, per hafnium in the in the crust, they will be they will be developing along very different trajectories. Uh, if we look at a plot of H on the x-axis and then the radiogenic uh, 176 hafnium um, concentration along the y-axis. Um, 
the great thing about zircon is that hafnium, uh, because it's basically a major element in zircon and replaces uh, the zirconium, is much more abundant than lutetium. So over time, there's basically no change in the hafnium isotope composition, composition of the zircon. So whatever happens to that zircon, unless it completely melts, uh, it should record the hafnium isotopic composition of the rock that it formed in initially, not that we find it in later on. But wherever that zircon sits, um, the whole rock around it, because it will have more lutetium than the actual zircon probably, will keep growing radiogenic hafnium. So any zircon that forms at a later stage, so if we start with the zircon and form as a more zircon later, should be more radiogenic because it will uh, soak up any hafnium produced uh, in the rock that it's hosted in, and that by, uh, will be more radiogenic than that of the original zircon. We can either achieve that uh, by just radiogenic ingrowth in the local area, or if we create new melt out of uh, the mantle that has previously been depleted and mix that with our crust, then we get some, uh, some weird mixing patterns as well. But really, uh, any old zircon should uh, always be less radiogenic and hafnium than new zircon. And we can't really go below horizontal. There's one way to go by uh, horizontal, and that is by uh, not changing the hafnium isotopic composition of the zircon, but by removing the lead, um, because the lead is a direct measure in our H connect. And if we plot H on the x-axis, so we can move horizontally without changing the hafnium if we change the uranium lead um, system in the zircon. And that can happen much easier than for hafnium, because the lead is produced by radioactive decay of uranium, so it's not structurally burned in the crystal lattice, whereas the hafnium is, is uh, a major component in zircon and actually is structurally bound. So it's easier to lose the lead than to mess with the hafnium. So if we see a horizontal pattern, uh, we can infer that lead loss has affected this uh, zircon population because otherwise we would see a pattern where the radiogenic uh, hafnium should go up. Uh, or even if we mix it with something down here, it should go down, but not just stay horizontal. And these are the results for our three samples. Not Gorm at the top right, uh, the unpronounceable area at the bottom right, and then the um, ascent block scary more sample on the bottom left. And we see that every sample is, is one color. We see that basically they all show these lead loss trends. Um, and therefore, we can't interpret too much into the hafnium, but it tells us that lead loss is, a, is an important process here um, uh, in our zircon population. So if we then look at the ge geochronology, and even if you think back to uh, that colored plot uh, with, with, or, uh, with yellow, no, with blue and red um, cores and rims, and how it was difficult to sort of separate really anything out. If I plot one sample here, uh, we see exactly the same. It's not like that all the cores are old, and all the rims are young, but everything is all over the shop. But thanks to the hafnium isotopes, we know that this is probably a result of uh, lead loss. And we mix everything up because not every zircon will uh, experience the same amount of uh, lead loss. Uh, so what I've done, I've basically thrown them all in, into one pot and then sorted them by age and plotted them equidistant, something like this. And this is a, a pattern uh, that we then get without a bias of wanting to interpret into cores and rims. And basically what we see is we get areas where we've got fairly flat um, part of the curve with many zircons, um, so many zircons of a fairly uh, confined age space. And then we got big jumps in between uh, these sort of flat patterns. I call them ramps for here. We've got very few or no zircons um, of a given given age. And then uh, in theory, uh, this could mean that this is sort of like a zircon forming event. Um, at, in this case, about 2750. Um, and then all of this is just variable lead loss from zircons that formed in this event down to some point. Where, so this would be the sample potentially with the most extreme lead loss. Um, and here's another event that probably happened in this case at around 25, 25 or so uh, million years ago. And again, this would be its lead loss tail. Uh, 
Um, so this can help us where we struggle to find clear populations of, of uh, an age. If we now look at some of the dating for the Knokom and the Laxford Shear Zone, if we look at the first mafic knives that we saw, the Garnet Metagabro, we get uh, an age for, for the zircon populations. All of the grains, regardless of zone, um, have the same age pretty much, and we can construct a Concord Concordia age of um, about 2.5 billion years. And the Lucas zone is basically indistinguishable within error um, from that, also around 2.49 uh, to 2.5 billion years old ago. Um, from the same locality, the, the second uh, mafic Lucas zone pair again shows a strong um, signal for about 2.5 billion year old um, grains. But in the mafic nice, we also see evidence. Uh, for some younger ages, and we can actually calculate two of these uh, 1.8 and 1.7 to 1.8 uh, billion year age populations uh, in that zircon. Again, if you look just at uh, a plot of these ramps and flats, you can see that these already look distinct considering the error bar, um, and then uh, we can calculate individual Concordia ages for those uh, with fairly decent. Um, W, uh, MSWDs and, and um, errors, uncertainties, I should say. And then interestingly, I mentioned this felsic sheet that cross cuts the entirety of Knobkorn. We also find uh, here uh, an older, and this is the example of the ramps and flats. We find an older group and a younger group, and the younger group again falls at um, with a slightly larger error, but around the 2.5 um, billion years ago. But then notably, we find a 2.7 to 2.8, um, fairly large errors, but still a fairly convincing amount of, of grains. Um, we find this, this 2.7 to 2.8 billion year old age that we don't know from the mafic gnosis that this leucosome is cutting. So this is probably uh, evidence that leucosome is not only sourced uh, at Knorkorm itself, but must have deeper roots somewhere where it taps older um, rocks. If we go to Scourie Moor in the uh, proper granulite facies, almost type locality, uh, we don't find any zircon in the mafic nice. So mafic, maybe uh, it was too mafic to actually preserve any. But in the Luca zone, we find uh, two sort of convincing populations, um, an older group at 2.75 billion years and a younger group at 2.5 billion years. And um, although, we can't really calculate any sort of uh, convincing Concordia or even um, intercept ages for the felvic sheet that cross cut these niases because we don't find a clear age group. If we look at the arrays here again, we've uh, got a, a fairly large flat that formed uh, similar to a lot of the other um, uh, parts around 2.75. Um, billion years ago, and we've got a younger population again around the 2.5-ish um, mark. So not, not a convincing age actually calculated, but looking at the population overall, they look similar to, to where we do get um, meaningful ages. And then the third locality in the Grunard block, south of the Strathon line, uh, we've got mafic gnises that are a bit uh, better behaved almost. Um, and one of the mafic gnises, we've got a clear older and younger group not necessarily correlating with domains, but we get two nice ages at 2.75 and 2.5. In the Lucas zone, basically the same 2.75-ish and 2.5. Uh, and here they, they even behave well enough to um, the cores being old and the rivers being young. And we see a similar in, a, 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 in the second Lucas zone, again with cores of 2.7. Three or so and 2.5 rims. And the felsic sheet that sort of is there is a fairly small one, so it's probably more locally derived than the big ones um, in the previous localities. Um, but it's, it's clearly cross cutting the fabric and, and uh, it's more straight, not as fingered as one of those leucosomes. It doesn't have any paratactics. We also find the 2.7 uh, and, and a bit and the 2.5 billion years. That's a lot of ages I've just thrown at you. Uh, from these three localities. So I've summed them up in this table here with an uh, 
age axis at the top going from uh, right old to left young. Um, and I've just listed all the samples that I've dated. And I've plotted both um, population ages that were either uh, calculated using a Concordia age or uh, an uh, upper intercept age. Uh, but I've also added a lot of the sort of individual things uh, that didn't really fit into a clear population, uh, but were basically at the top end of this sort of uh, flat and ramp spectrum, flat and ramp spectrum, um, but sort of more isolated and couldn't really fit in with any population. If we then look at those um, in a bit of detail and look at the orange box first, we see uh, that both at Scarry Moor in the Ascent block and at uh, this Loch An something uh, locality in the Grunard block, where we see a very similar pattern. We've got basically in every sample a convincing, I should point here, a convincing um, 2.75 ish um, age uh, that we could ascribe to the Bancalian um, first granulite passage event. And we've got a about 2.5 billion year old event. That we could ascribe to the invariant event as it was sort of proposed earlier already. So basically, Scarry Moor and, and uh, in the Assen block and the Grunard block show exactly the same signal. Um, so they, they have a common history and they're not, in fact, uh, necessarily um, part of a separate metamorphic story. Um, interestingly, the felsic sheet uh, that cross cuts Knockholm in the or close to the Lax or Chia zone, actually looks much more like this uh, central region granulite facies. Um, uh, nice in terms of its circum signal. And if you compare that with the Knob Gorm area in the green box, uh, we only have sort of invariant pages here as, as the main metamorphic event. We've got a few older ages that might be igneous or not. Um, but it's the only area where we see these uh, um, younger ages of 1.8 to 1.7, uh, which are typically uh, typical for these Maxfordian ages. And then if we look at um, these individuals, and I'm almost done, so don't worry. Um, at these individual circuit analyses, they're all 206, 207 ages. And we uh, also remind ourselves of the protolith ages that have been published, either listed from uh, Kinney et al. Um, or added in a, in a later publication for the Laxford Shear Zone by Good Enough. Uh, we see that in the north, we've got something like 2.6 and 2.85. In the Laxford Shear Zone, we got about 2.845. Uh, in the ascent block, we've got 2.96 to 3 billion year old protolith ages, whereas in the Grunard block, we have 2.84 billion year old um, ages. And then in the southern region, we get the oldest rocks. We've got a 2.8 something as well here, but we also have evidence for a much older 3.125 billion year old age. But if I look at these, uh, even though the individual uh, zircon they must have grown through some form of event. And there's a fairly convincing cluster here, for example, between 2.8 and 2.9. Um, and again, we see some of those here in, in the other terrain as well. And uh, in, in the Grunard block, we even see much older. So if I just add those uh, new ages from, from our study um, to this list, we actually then suddenly uh, see a much more homogeneous uh, pattern. We've got up here, we've got the uh, 2.68 and the 2.84, uh, 2.84. Here we get 2.85. Here we've got 2.84 and in our study 2.85. And here we got 2.82. But also these older ages become more abundant with our sample. So in the um, in the ascent block we got uh, up to 2.94, uh, which within error is probably the same as this. And in the Grunard block we go uh, down to ages as old as the 330 in the ascent block, but even as old as the, the really old ages in the southern region. So really, uh, in terms of protolith, uh, now with the addition of our uh, mafic migmatite um, data, we actually see that the entirety of the mainland Louisian uh, looks fairly similar and maybe doesn't necessarily need to be subdivided 
at least not for geochronolog geochronological reasons. Um, I want to uh, make one comment generally on this uh, uh, thing in TTG NICEF, and it's half a comment, half a question. So if, if uh, nobody has any questions at the end, maybe this could be something we can discuss. Um, and this is this uh, originally found in TTG NICEF's protolith age variability. And, and I wonder whether the oldest zircons in the TTG NICE do really date the crystallization age of the TTG magma, or are they actually inherited from the mafic floors to the TTG, which would then mean that if you see variability along a stretch like the Louisian in the oldest TTG zircons, that doesn't mean that all of these individual TTG samples intruded at a different time. They just come from a, a mafic rock area that could be the same age, but might not, or, or part of, of two ages, uh, but not every TTG uh, comes from a mafic rock that actually was able to give the TTG uh, some zircons because they might have uh, been dissolved as part of the melting process um, or were never there because the rocks were too mafic. And... Okay, having said that, there's really three points that I wanted to make today and I'll sum them up now. Um, there's a 2.7 and a 2.5 event, both uh, in the Ascent and the Grunat block. So there's really on, on geochronological grounds, no reason for a subdivision of the central region. And with the new portalit ages uh, from our mafic nices for the Ascent and Grunat blocks um, that are very similar to the published protolith ages of pretty much all other mainland blocks. Um, it's sort of like, uh, that, that all of these uh, blocks of the Louisian are more similar than previously recognized. And maybe there really are just different crust levels, or, or maybe there are just literally just one piece of contiguous Archean crust without even uh, different crust levels. Um, and then coming back to the other question, so that's the Louisian uh, question answered in my opinion. <laughs> um, the other question is that these new findings for the Louisian um, despite having been a, a highly studied high-grade nice terrain, uh, thanks to zircon and mafic nigmatites, really. And that is maybe because uh, mafic rocks really have a simpler zircon record. Thanks very much for your attention, and sorry for running a bit long. No worries, that was good, uh, Ratsi. I have some questions already for you in the chat. Uh, a few from uh, Kaysander Sarwan during the during the talk. The right. first one. Hmm? Right. <laughs> All right. So the first one is the P, was uh, in the PT estimation method. Why do the estimates of possible stability of the mineral after grinding it up vary so tech, so significantly for each instance or cycle? And is the PT path clockwise or anti-clockwise? Um, I can go back to that figure. Here we go. I'm not sure about um, the first part of the question. Maybe you can repeat that in a minute, but I answer the second part. Uh, one reason for the uh, clockwise nature of the PT part is that uh, there are areas where we see um, coronae uh, forming around garnet. And that's a very typical texture for more or less isothermal uh, decompression. So we've got evidence from the rocks that uh, we went from high temperatures, uh, high pressures to low temperatures without changing, uh, from high pressures to low pressures without changing the um, temperature too much. So that would imply a, a clockwise PT path. And could you repeat the first part again? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and post it in the everyone chat for you. Um, there it is. Why do the estimates of possible stability of the mineral after grinding it up vary so significantly for each instance or cycle? Um, I'm not sure what is meant by instance or cycle, but I should clarify that um, we grind up the entire rock to get a, a chemical composition for the rock. We feed that into sort of uh, the modeling software that, that uses a database. And, and from the geochemical data and thermodynamic data in the database, it calculates uh, for basically for each PT point, 
a stable mineral assemblage. And then you basically sort of like create fields around points that have the same mineral assemblage. Um, so we then go back to our thin section uh, and look what minerals we've got in this rock and then find the field of, of the stable minerals. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what is meant uh, by the variation for each instant or cycle. If this, if this is down to these different stability fields, that's basically just, they are all different uh, rocks with a different bulk rock composition. So this diagram here will look different uh, for a uh, slightly different, at least for every different rock. Um, and therefore the fields that we actually see uh, will be larger or smaller. And by combining a lot of these fields, we can sort of narrow it down to, to the overlap area if that makes sense. I hope this sort of answers the question. If not, please ask again. And I'm sure we can either uh, uh, come to an agreement or Mike can chip in. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to a couple of other points that he asked. He says, is there any particular reason for the considerably large garnets at the Nakhorm locality? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I, sort of garnet always varies wherever you sort of um, uh, look at it. And it's it's down to uh, uh, nucleation rate and, and growth rate really of garnet, but I don't know what's different about the knockgorm. Um, or we actually find similar sized garnets in several other places. Uh, what's different here to, to, um, uh, to other uh, localities out with the Lewis, for example, where the garnets are smaller. It, it might be down to the extremely high temperatures, but that's me uh, speculating here. Okay, Rob, I see your hand up. I'm just working through um, these ones from Case Under Sir One. One more from him. Why specifically use hafnium instead of another naturally occurring group, group four element like titanium? Oh, uh, we use hafnium because it's radiogenic, um, produced by the decay of rotation. So it will vary across um, different samples and different sample groups. And uh, hafnium uh, still fits better in the in the zircon structure than titanium does. So, like we've we've got hafnium on the order of uh, weight percent, whereas titanium is on the order of uh, parts per million, really, even despite being a four plus mineral uh, element. Okay, so it's more abundant, it, but, it's, but, but it's because we got this uh, isotopic story hidden within it. Okay, he said he sent thank you in the chat. Um, okay, cool. Okay, Rob, would you like to go ahead and um, unmute yourself? Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I just have a question about, um, have you considered the considerable amount of detrital zircon geochronology that exists for the overlying Torridonian succession? Because uh, I would argue that that provides a pretty unbiased sampling of naturally abraded zircons from the underlying Lewisian succession. That is true. And um, if, if we look at these eight spectra, um, they, they basically show these like, uh, older than 2.9, uh, the 2.7 to 2.8 to 2.5, and then the uh, 1.7, 1.8 years sort of as peaks. So they, they sort of show that this is true for the Lewisian, but because it's a sediment and it sort of has a catchment that we can't, like we know it's from the Lewisian nice, but we don't know exactly from which area necessarily. Um, we don't really know, we can't say for certain uh, whether that um, let me say it differently. It, it wouldn't help us pin down whether there's uh, different geochronologies in different sections of the Lewisian, but uh, because it's uh, a sediment, it would tell us basically the story of the entire Lewisian at once. Well, you have some pretty good paleocurrent data from both the, the store group and the Torridon group, which uh, tells you where the, the, the rivers that deposited those uh, sandstones are coming from, and particularly the uh, Torridon group, which shows stuff coming from the Northwest. So if you have very little data for the uh, Outer Hebrides, uh, that would be, a, I, I think, a pretty good uh, sampling of, of the rocks from there, which you haven't really presented. And maybe there's 
there are some data from there, but there are much less data, right? There, there is definitely less data there, yeah. Um, so, there's, there's, so yeah. have a look at um, the paper by Martin uh, Krabendam uh, and some of my earlier work, which is, you know, pretty low end, but uh, um, that, uh, you know, show uh, the data for potentially from that area. Okay, cool. Thank you. Do, do, do you remember off the top of your head whether it looks different in terms of uh, those age peaks? Um, no, I can't, I can't remember. I know that uh, the later paper by um, Lorraine Lebeau, which is published in Precambrian Research a couple years ago uh, from the store group, have a lot of the, you know, the ages that you've been talking about uh, today. Okay. Well, I'll have a look at that. I, I have yeah. to admit, I haven't looked too much into the, uh, the, the sediments on top, but thanks. Sure. All right, we've got another one uh, from Bodo Weber. Wonderful, wonderful talk, Fatsi. Do you have any control from CL images for your different groups of zircons? Um, I do. And um, if, if I wouldn't have already been at uh, the sort of, um, uh, upper end of the eight uh, of the of the time spectrum, I might have included some of them, but I've sort of tried to hint at um, that um, uh, with this plot here. So really, we don't have any uh, proper control in in some of the samples, at least, where we find uh, young young cores, um, and we find old cores, and we find young rims, and we find old rims. And so if you plot them up here, uh, uh, they, they are a bit all over the shop. I also should say that not uh, these are not necessarily all pairs. So sometimes I've rejected uh, analyses and I've rejected quite a few analyses because they were discordant um, or because they had really high common let and therefore didn't wouldn't produce a sort of a, a waterproof um, 206, 207 age. Yeah, watertight. Um, so it's it's sort of in some samples like like this example here, um, which is this one. Uh, we just have this older group and this younger group, and there's cores and rims in this group, and there's cores and rims in that group. And and if we just look at them as a group, they give us ages. Um, but if we look at uh, this locality here, so for example, in this uh, in this leucosome sample, definitely the older group is cores and the younger group is rims. So in some samples, the sort of uh, age domain, uh, the, the zircon domain, correlates with with the age group. Uh, in other samples, it does not. Okay. Great. Let's see. Uh, so we don't have any more questions written. Um, uh, invite whoever would like to open discussion. Go ahead and unmute yourself from chat. Um, hi, but uh, I have uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, one, uh, so for GNOME, GORM, yeah. uh, uh, like you can still argue that either it's a different structural level or it's, uh, um, it's a different terrain. And I'm wondering if there are any samarium neodymium uh, ages uh, to to tell that there is a lower uh, sort of uh, structural level with all the ages in this region. Um, there, there is quite a few submarine neodymium uh, data published by the Louisian. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure at the moment what that um, tells us. I mean, I agree. It's it's worth looking at. But I don't know whether it um, basically so, answers your question. But so, so. Uh, what I would say is um, uh, this Knockholm area is basically here. And then uh, shortly thereafter is this Laxford shear zone that juxtaposes, or, or at least is at the contact of this Laxfordian dominated and the Batkalian dominated uh, regions. Um, they could be separate terrains, but they could also be just different levels. Um, and uh, why I think they might just be different levels is because this Knockholm thing sort of uh, sits within the shear zone, but um, we've got this um, this felsic sheet that 
cuts through uh, Knockholm that gives us an age pattern that is similar uh, to the central region, which should be the uh, lower to middle crust, um, despite the, the hosting rock uh, having ages that are more similar to the um, northern region uh, in terms of the sort of middle middle crust and fibrillite species, if that makes sense. So from, from this felsic sheet, I think uh, that there is an argument that these uh, uh, were linked at least at the time that that felsic sheet formed. Because and, of these old ages up. And felsic sheet is around uh, 2.5 or something? Uh, it's got 2.7 uh, and 2.5 ages, yeah. But whether the 2.5 is a metamorphic overprint or whether it's the intrusion age is a bit tricky to say. Because it's in, in contact with the melting fabric, uh, it might be it might be the, the older age but and then overprinted, but that's more speculation than founded in any sort of proof. So, so you have 2.7 Filsic sheet uh, cutting through at uh, 2.5 uh, units would give you 2.5 ages. Yes. I'm not saying that the felsic sheet necessarily is 2.5 uh, old, but it carries a substantial, substantial zircon population of 2.7, but also okay. of 2.5. Okay. Uh, well, by summarium, neodymium, I was implying if it was uh, some. Uh, crustal component all day, you would probably sense it as a source. Um, yeah, if, if there would be a difference between the two, yeah. And the second question, and I think I know answer, but uh, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, so when you have uh, initial hafnium uh, plotted against stage and you have uh, sort of flat uh, horizontal trend, um, yeah. uh, so, uh, is it possible that it's a mixing trend? Uh, so, for example, uh, you have a um, mafic intrusion and you at whatever 2.8, 2.9, and it gets this uh, zircon incorporate uh, hafnium and get this values, and in mafic. Uh, magma, you would have very little lutetium. Uh, so if yeah. you would remelt this uh, mafic intrusion, uh, you would get new zircon ages, but you would uh, retain the same hafnium ratios. And I guess so it, I, um, it's it's not correct because you would still probably have some lutetium in the mafic intrusion, right? Yeah, um, and I've. Uh, not talked about this, but actually for uh, one or two of the samples, we've done um, bulk rock hafnium. We, we tried to do it for more, but uh, the dissolution didn't really work, and then we ran out of money to repeat it. But where we are confident that the dissolution worked uh, properly, uh, we get uh, lutetium to uh, 176 to hafnium uh, 177 ratios of 0.022, I think, which is um, not quite as uh, um, high as mafic uh, Archean crust, but it's higher than sort of the average uh, continental crust that is usually assumed when people uh, calculate the radiogenic ingrowth. So there's actually more lutetium even in, in the nicest than, than you would think. Okay. There, there will be less lutetium probably compared to um, uh, a granite, just because there's more trace elements in a granite, but the ratio of lutetium to hafnium um, uh, will be higher in a mafic rock as opposed to a felsic rock. Okay, Tony, uh, Tony Trave has his hand up, so go ahead and meet yourself. Uh, thanks. I, I'd just like to make a comment, come back to something that Rob Rainbird has suggested in terms of looking at uh, the overlying suprocrustal rocks. Um, we did think about that, but what I would say is that the amount of Archean zircon in those rocks is very, very minimal relative to a whole array of Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic zircon. So 
it's not quite the panacea uh, you might think. The, the store group is different because it is sitting in, in, in small little localized basins on the Lewisian, but the overwhelming amount of detritus, the detrital zircons in the broad distribution of the of the Torridonian is is very scarce with respect to the Archean. So so we did think about it, even though Botsy says he doesn't think about the sediments, which um, quite often he doesn't, but we have given it a thought, but it is a good idea and try and find um, places where we could perhaps uh, look at some of the suprocrustal rocks. Um, but it's really surprising how little the Archean signal is in the Torridonian, even though it is sitting quite often on the Archean basement itself. And, and that's that's the only point I wanted to make. I guess you can use a Loc Marie group, which would be the closest to, to the well, um, well, not quite, Andre. Uh, that's very, very limited in terms of uh, yeah. the amount of rock that's actually there. And I know you love the Loc Marie rocks, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and we have done that. We have uh, seen that. We do pick up some of the zircons that Botsy's talking about. All right, great. Well, it seems like um, discussion has fizzled out. Really great talk today, Botsy. Um, it was great to have you. Uh, so uh, um, everybody will uh, meet again next week to hear from Christoph Kubek. And until then, stay safe. Thanks very much. Thanks for all. Yeah. See you all. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.